Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, electric eel shocks may transfer DNA into the cells of other organisms, the stomach contents of a young tyrannosaur has been discovered, the earliest fossil mosquito has been found, and much, much more. First up in the recent news is an absolutely fascinating study that reports on the results of experiments done on electric eels, which show that their electrical pulses can actually transfer DNA into the cells of other organisms. The paper explains how transferring genes via intense pulses of electricity is a well-established method used in genetic engineering, as an electric field creates temporary pores in a cell membrane that can then be used to deliver molecules into the cell, a technique called electroporation. So the researchers thought that perhaps the electric organ discharges of electric eels in their aquatic habitats might have a similar effect on the cells of nearby organisms. In order to test this hypothesis, they put zebrafish larvae into water that contained DNA which codes for a green fluorescent protein, so that if the DNA transfer occurred, they would be able to see the larvae fluoresce. They then introduced an electric eel and got it to discharge electricity by getting it to bite. So what were the results? Well, some of the zebrafish embryos in the tank with the electric eel did indeed show a mosaic expression of the fluorescence, while the control group, which did not have an electric eel in the tank with them, showed little distinct fluorescence. This does therefore seem to indicate that the discharges of electric eels can function as an electroporator and facilitate the transfer of DNA into cells. This obviously isn't the main function of the discharges, which are used for sensing, defence and predation, but the impact of gene transfer in a natural environment is very interesting to think about, but needs much more research to fully understand. So, quite a shocking revelation. You're terrible, Ben. I don't know why you put that in there. Awful, honestly. I take no blame for that. Some unfortunate news next, as this week has also seen the official declaration by the International Union for Conservation of Nature of the first recognised marine fish extinction. The Java stingaree was a kind of stingray and was only ever known to science based on a single specimen that had been collected in 1862 where it was found in a fish market in Indonesia. It was easily recognised as a new species, looking very different to all other rays in the nearby area. But since 1862, no more specimens of this fish have been reported. Many surveys have attempted to find more examples of this fish, especially in the years since 2001, but nothing has been reported. Therefore, the IUCN has now officially ruled the Java stingaree as extinct. The reason for its extinction is likely due to habitat degradation, as the northern coast of Java has become more industrialised. This extinction is therefore an important warning sign for everyone to be aware of, and as the scientists say, the Java stingaree is really only the tip of the iceberg for the extinctions that are likely to follow. In addition, at COP28 on Monday, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, issued an update to the Red List of Threatened Species. It makes for pretty grim reading with 44,000 species threatened with extinction, which is roughly 2,000 more than last year. For 6,700 species threatened with extinction, climate change is making conditions worse for them. For example, due to higher sea levels, the nests of Central, South Pacific and East Pacific green turtles are inundated with seawater and so fewer baby turtles hatch. Warming waters can also damage the seagrass that they graze upon. Frogs, salamanders and other amphibians are really suffering, with around 41% of these species being under threat. Amphibians are unable to move away from the adverse conditions, so any change in their environment has a huge impact on them. The IUCN update also includes the first global freshwater fish assessment. Surprisingly, freshwater fishes make up more than half of the world's known fish species, whilst freshwater ecosystems only make up 1% of aquatic habitats. However, this amazing biodiversity is under threat, with 25% of freshwater fish being at risk of extinction. 17% of these are affected by climate change due to conditions such as decreasing water levels, rising sea levels causing seawater to move up rivers and shifting seasons. With this sad news about our planet's ever decreasing and threatened biodiversity, 
one can only hope that COP28 finishes with a comprehensive plan on how the world can move forward in a bid to reduce its use of fossil fuels. Now some happier news. <laughs> First up in the paleontology news for this week is an incredible new study describing a young tyrannosaur skeleton with exceptionally well-preserved stomach contents, revealing what the last meals of this dinosaur were. I bet you can smell it. The tyrannosaur fossil is a juvenile Gorgosaurus liberatus individual that was uncovered from rocks in the Dinosaur Park formation of Alberta, Canada, and it dates to the late Cretaceous, around 75 million years ago. It's housed in the world-famous Royal Tyrell Museum and is especially significant for being the first ever documented example of stomach contents that are properly preserved in their anatomical position in any tyrannosaur. So what had this young predator been eating? The bones from two different individuals of a species called Citipes are present inside the abdominal cavity, a kind of oviraptorosaur. The really interesting thing about this though is that the Citipes remains inside the Tyrannosaur are just the bones from the hind limbs and a segment from the end of the tail. This seems to suggest that the young Gorgosaurus was preferentially feeding on the legs of these dinosaurs dismembering their carcasses to just eat their hind limbs, which would make sense as these would be the parts of the animal that contained a lot of muscle. I mean, I do love like chicken legs, chicken. you know, like that's yeah, the best that's part of the chicken, isn't it? Yeah. This also might suggest that the young tyrannosaur was limited in the size of the prey that it could consume due to the size of its pharyngeal opening and couldn't manage to swallow the body's hull. Based on the relative locations within the abdominal cavity and the difference in the amount of acid etching on them from the tyrannosaur's stomach acids, the paleontologists could work out that they were consumed in two separate feeding events, with the bones that are positioned closer towards the back of the tyrannosaur having been eaten first. The Citipes individuals were also very young animals, both being killed within their first year alive, suggesting that young Gorgosaurus may have deliberately been going after recently hatched babies of this species, a very specific kind of targeting that is also seen in some modern carnivores. The fossil also confirms something that was already inferred about the change in tyrannosaur diets as they grew older, showing that juveniles were going after small, fast-moving prey that wouldn't have posed as much of a threat as the giant mega herbivores that adults fed on. It also confirms that younger tyrannosaurs filled a very different niche to the adults, filling the mid-sized predator role of the ecosystem and explaining why such mesopredatory species appear to be rare or absent in these late Cretaceous terrestrial ecosystems. Systems. So an absolutely fantastic discovery that's told us so much about the feeding habits and growth of these incredible dinosaurs. Some more incredibly exciting paleontology news next, as the skull of an absolutely enormous pliosaur has been revealed after it was excavated along the Dorset coast in England. This skull is two metres long and one of the most complete pliosaur skulls to ever be found. It's now being housed in the Etchers collection in the small town of Kimmeridge in Dorset, where it will be put on display in the new year, a museum that's based around the incredible fossil collection of one man, Steve Etchers. This pliosaur was found by a local collector, Phil Jacobs, who came across the very tip of the snout lying on the beach near to Kimmeridge and realised that the rest of the skull was probably still in the cliff. Contacting Steve Etchers, they put together a team to excavate the skull, which was situated a good 15 metres above the beach level. It then took many months to fully prepare, but the end result is absolutely incredible. And, as if this isn't all cool enough, the whole excavation of the pliosaur was recorded by the BBC for a documentary all about this fossil that's being aired on New Year's Day, hosted by the man himself, Sir David Attenborough. Yes. This huge skull quite possibly represents a new species of pliosaur, and it will be very exciting to see the documentary and learn more about this amazing animal as paleontologists study it. There's more exciting marine reptile news next, as another new mosasaur has also been named this week. Coming from late Cretaceous aged rocks in Japan, dating to around 72 million years ago, it's called Megapterygius wakayamaensis. We'll go with that. Yeah. Most of the skull and body are preserved, including three of the limbs, and it's quite an unusual mosasaur, possessing hind flippers that were longer than the fore flippers, and also having extra digits in each limb that gave it very broad wing-like paddles. The authors suggest that these massive paddles likely enabled the mosasaur to manoeuvre very quickly, 
as seen in some modern whales with large flippers. It also most likely had a dorsal fin, as suggested by the anatomy of some of the vertebrae. So, Megapterygius is an amazing new addition to our knowledge of these marine reptiles. Up next in the paleontology news, a paper has been published describing the earliest known fossil mosquitoes. These mosquitoes were found trapped in early Cretaceous aged amber in Lebanon and consist of two males that possess piercing mouth parts that were most likely used to feed on blood. I seem to remember there being a film about this or something. The discovery of these preserved mosquitoes is actually quite significant for a few reasons. Named as the new species Libanoculex intermedius, they have extended the known range of mosquitoes further back into the Cretaceous, decreasing the extent of the ghost lineage gap for these insects, as molecular studies have estimated that they originated in the Jurassic. The Libanoculex lineage seems to have diverged even earlier than another extinct mosquito lineage known from the Cretaceous aged fossils meaning they represent the earliest branching mosquito group known to science. The anatomy of their mouth parts, which show they were probably feeding on blood, is also significant, as the evolution of blood sucking in mosquitoes is still unclear since they don't have the best fossil record. A blood feeding habit likely first started in the mosquito lineage after they shifted from feeding on plant fluids, repurposing their piercing mouth parts to get into the skin of vertebrates, but working out exactly where this occurred has been difficult. Libanoculex therefore shows that this feeding style had already appeared by this point in time. Additionally, the fact that these are male individuals is pretty surprising, since modern male mosquitoes do not feed on blood, instead consuming nectar or plant sap, though very rare occurrences of males feeding on blood has been recorded. Which is strange, because all the men I know feed on blood. <laughs> blood-sucking creatures. So it's a really interesting new discovery, and I'm sure nothing bad will happen when a rich guy decides to extract DNA from them and build a park full of dinosaurs. And finally in the news for this week, we have an interesting new study comparing the impact of the end Triassic mass extinction on marine and terrestrial ecosystems. The researchers explain how the ecological severity of mass extinctions has been well studied for marine settings before, as paleontologists use a method whereby different marine species are organised into functional groups depending on their ecologies, producing what are known as ecospace cubes. These cubes nicely show the variety of species filling different roles in the ecosystem, and can be used to track the effects that an extinction has on them. This study is the first time that this approach has been used on a terrestrial ecosystem, and the scientists use it to compare how marine versus terrestrial settings were affected by the extinction at the end of the Triassic period, just before the Jurassic started. They found that the functional groups in the terrestrial setting were actually affected more than the marine groups, and continued to experience ecological stresses for longer after the extinction than in the marine settings. This is therefore not only a significant paper for applying this technique to terrestrial paleo environments for the first time, but it's also very interesting in showing these effects of the extinction were felt for a much longer time on land compared to in the ocean. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed and thank you so much for watching. On a side note, I have made a video for the channel that's coming out this Sunday. It's about uh, the saber-toothed cat of England. So keep tuned for that and watch and like it and let me know if you want me to do more videos like it at all. <laughs>